Eesh, 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 eesh. That's the intro. Best of board game geek. Oh! You still doing that, Mike? I'm Nick. We are the Brothers of America. It's time to talk about everything that happened at Board Game Geek this last month. The hottest games. Not everything. There's a lot that goes There's on. So much, <laughs> There's so much. There's so much. Never mind. So, a very small <laughs> That's percentage really will be is. tiny, but it will it's be significant. Yeah. But now we're going to talk about some hotness. We're going to talk about some news. Talk about some of the games that we like. Some cool stuff that we found. So let's go ahead and just get right into the news. <laughs> So the first bit of Board Game Geek news is no small feat at all. Board Game Geek recently crossed the 100 million thumbs up threshold. That's a lot of people liking stuff over a long period of time. People have thumbed up and said, this picture is cool. This post is cool. This comment is cool. Whatever it might be, 100 million times. I don't even know how to think of that number. That's like like 100 million or something. That's like so many, that's such a big number. I think it's super cool. Someone's gonna give a little bit of a golf clap to Board Game Geek. I think that's a neat threshold. And here's to a billion. So of course we always do a geek game shop update and there are some new geek up bits. We have the Oceanic expansion for Wingspan, the Nectar. We have for Dice Throne season two. We know a lot of people who follow us who love Dice Throne. So they're super pumped about that. We have some new poker chips. We got the Targi expansion. We have a brand new tote bag. And back in stock, we have the bands that you can hold your boards together. It's kind of like, not rubber bands, kind of elastic bands that are really, really useful for holding board games together. And we have some terraforming Mars bits. And next month, they give us a little preview of the new Geek Up bits coming, and that's gonna be Dice City. Ooh, Dice City getting that Geek Up bit treatment. All right, let's do it. Hey, Nick. What? Haven't you forgotten that Board Game Geek has sweet new beanies now? Oh yeah, I guess I did get beanies. Get yours today. Also, I look way too much like Jay from Jay and Silent Bob with a beanie on. So that is some Board Game Geek news. Let's go down to this table right here and talk about the hotness. It's time to get hot, 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 hot. Hotness. It's the hottest time of the year this yeah. month. Every time, because we're doing the hotness, it's always hot. It is, you know, let's go ahead and get number 10. So number 10 is a game that we were hearing about. This is the, the month of Gen Con, right? Yes. This year at least. And so this game we were hearing about constantly. People were talking about and playing at Gen Con. That is The Loop. Right. This is a game that started getting into people's hands from yeah. uh, their Kickstarter yeah. of The Loop, as well as being sold at Gen Con. Uh, this is a like like time travel game. combo test. Yeah, you're trying to go against the Dr. Evil foe and stuff. And it's, yeah, what we hear is that there's a lot of combos and things you can build, but it feels really cooperative because you can do stuff that's really beneficial to your partners, you yes. know, your fellow players. It feels like it's table. really, really, truly cooperative. It's not just like, hey, we're all going towards the same goal. It's like, no, no, no. The things I'm doing, the combos I'm doing are actively helping you out. Yeah. Which and is that's always, really cool. That's, that's always nice. best. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that's the loop number 10. So number nine is Korra Rise of an Empire, which is, uh, again, we talked about last month because the cover had come out and people started yeah. talking about it because they knew it was coming out of Gen Con. Well, guess what? It came out of Gen Con and people seem to really like it. Yeah, it seems really interesting, kind of ancient Greek civ building yeah. situation. I saw a bit of a playthrough and it seems to be moved pretty there's quickly. Like, and there's like a lot going on, yeah. Yeah, there's like people, I remember seeing on people saying, I don't know what was happening, but uh, <laughs> people rolling dice and they're like, oh, that's good, I got 11. And then they're moving up tracks and they're like, I'm gonna spend my army people to do this thing over here. And I'm like, I don't know what this is, but I want to know. You know, like yeah, I got intrigued by it. It's, we were intrigued by it last month, and I'm, I'm now that it's kind of out, out. I want to start looking yeah. into it more and more because I'm like, this seems cool. I love the cover. I love the look of it. And yeah, and people are talking about it, people are playing it, and it seems like everyone's really digging it, and that's awesome. Yeah, that's number nine, Core Rise of the Empire. Let's get in number eight. So number eight is Cascadia. It's always here. It's gonna be sticking around for a while. I feel like it's post. always here, right? It's now starting to get into more people's hands. This is getting, getting to retail and things like that. Of course, Gen Con helped build up the hype for that because people were able to get their hands on it. This is just a weight of game people like. Yeah, it's right a very now. playable game. Yes, that's the thing is like this game is easy to get to the table. It's easy to teach. It's got a really great, tough puzzles, spatial reasoning, all that yeah. kind of stuff. A lot of variability because all the animals that you're trying to score in the game have different scoring abilities yeah. depending on which game you're playing. It's just really cool. It's super fun. We really like it. It's Cascade is a banger. It just yeah. is. It's just super solid. Um, love the theme, love the tile placement, very satisfying. And you can teach it to anybody in just a couple minutes. It's yeah. great. That's why it's number eight. Let's get to number seven. 
Number seven is Fractal Beyond the Void. This is a big space 4X, looks like a legacy game. Yeah. And it's got, you know, it's this, these kinds of games tend to do very well on BG, at least in terms of the hotness, because a lot of people like these big 4X space games. Epic we're actually, Tales. Yeah, yeah, we're not really into like the big space theme, like smaller space theme we can get into, but like, it's just not really our genre. People like these kinds of games. Yeah, this one's cool that it's legacy. Factions, yeah. Everyone has their kind of own thing they're doing. There's, you know, the ability to unlock secrets, gain new information. Uh, the game state may change. It's got like a living galaxy yeah. is what they're calling it, which seems cool. Yeah. I'm like, that seems awesome. Seems cool. So for people who like these kinds of games, this looks like a banger. I mean, it, it's, it's got a great cover. It look, the game looks really cool. And so it's like, all right, that I'm, I'm down. You know, it's just because right. it's not it's like our cup of tea doesn't mean it's not BGG's cup of tea, you know? Absolutely. So that's Fractal Beyond the Void at number seven. Let's get to number six. So we just talked about like space doesn't necessarily do it for us, but if you focus in on a part I feel of like space, the big space doesn't do much. It's for too us. much space. Yes, but it's Luna Capital is all about the moon and specifically building a colony that can sustain life uh, forever on the moon. It's accurate. We're trying to do that right now, Connor. You know, kinda, trying to figure it out. I kind of dig. I that love that theme, theming because yeah. it's like okay, and does it, uh, the job of of using cards and tiles and things. You're trying to build efficiently. Yes, kind of makes sense thematically for space. It's like you have to you build efficiently. Be dialed in. Is so you know how hard it is to get stuff in space? It's so hard. It's, it's really hard. You can't just go up willy nilly. Like, do I think I'm going to need this? Like, no. You better know you're going to need. Yeah, it to exactly. Put it into space. And so Luna Capital seems to do that. It's got a nice tone by yeah. the look of it. it. Doesn't seem to be not too, too serious. Heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's one that kind of intrigued us and it looks to be a little bit different. Love that theme. Uh, so Luna Capital is one that's interesting to us and apparently to other people because it's number six on the hotness. Yeah, a lot of people talking about it. And it's number six, you get number five. Number five is here every single month. Although its counterpart is not here this time. We just missed. Number five is Dune Imperium. Lost Ruins of Arnok and Dune Imperium are always like with each other. Lost you know Ruins of Arnok. Space. Space, exact space and worms. Yeah. The two also, I feel like evergreen themes. <laughs> <laughs> tremors <laughs> and space. Because I maintain Dune is just tremors. Fight me in the comments. Do it. Yeah. You should. Dune Imperium is a, uh, as we know well by this point, is a, a blend of kind of worker placement yeah. and deck building uh, set in the universe of Dune. So you're going to be playing as like kind of one of the houses, uh, the characters and things that you'd expect with artwork that's based on the upcoming movie yeah. or a movie that's basically here now, yeah, finally yeah. after all the delays. Um, and uh, it is really fun. You still haven't had a chance to play it. I have a chance to yeah. play it. I get why it's so popular. It really is it's a very solid good. game. Yeah. Uh, and so for after all these years, basically a year in to be number five on the hotness is pretty impressive. It's still doing good. It's I mean, doing very and to be well fair, so. Lost Rooms of Honor probably would have been number 11. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's just it's there. Once that expansion hits, oh, it's gonna be the hottest. Don't worry, Let's next month, you'll see we'll Lost We'll probably be talking about it again. But nonetheless, Doom Period was number five. Number four is a game that I feel like this was the most talked about game at Gen Con, at least maybe in our circles, and that is Furnace. Furnace yeah. is a game that people are playing, people are talking about Furnace. It's got such a good look. It's and got a it's really great. striking cover, yes. and it happens to be a good game that uses auctioning and engine building. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Um, but it's just, uh, it's, it's, it, it's Again, that talk about playable games. It's fairly easy to understand. It goes by quickly. It's only really four quick. quick rounds. Uh, so it makes sense that at Gen Con, people had a chance to get it, start to play and it, maybe play in the it. Evenings, and that's the thing. And yeah. then more people buy it the next day, and it kind of creates that momentum. I really think that's a big, that's a very good point. Is like people were able to play this while at Gen Con. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're buying some big old game, you might yeah. not. Have been, Gen Con's not the best playing convention. You know, it's yeah. like it's mostly for buying. But Furnace, you can pop down, doesn't take up a big footprint. Right. It's like, yeah, and Furnace is really, it's really good. Yeah, it's really solid. So that's number four on the hotness, Furnace. Okay, yeah, number three. The number three is a game that I didn't really know much about, but now I'm very I interested know. in. It's called Mythwind. It's on Kickstarter right now. And this is a, a game without an ending, pretty much. It's like this co-op game in this fantasy universe where everyone is playing a different character, but everyone's kind of playing a different game. Like one of the characters, you're like deck building. One of the characters, you're like tile laying. One of the characters, you're doing worker placement, I think. All of this, but the game like doesn't really have like an end. That's you the kind main of just question. People say like, how's the game end? And the designers are like, yeah, eventually you'll yeah. run out of stuff to do, but Doesn't... it seems like it's kind of like this ongoing experience. And I'm like, what? But it's really, really pretty. I love the fact that like all the different characters are kind of playing like a different game. Yeah. It's gorgeous, they got like game trays and stuff. It's like, it's got like uh, 600 grand on Kickstarter. It's crushing. I'm really intrigued I'm by this I'm really one. intrigued by this looking one. looking in, I'm like, really? We're like, what is this? Mm. Yeah, so Mythwind seems very interesting. I, I'm, I'm, we're gonna, it's a little expensive. We're gonna keep our eye on it because I'm like, think about this, this might be something we back because that looks pretty darn cool. But Mythwind is number three. Check it out. It's very interesting. Now space isn't necessarily <laughs> our theme, Mike. You know what it is? 
printing presses. <laughs> we're so boring, dude. I know. Gutenberg is what we're talking about, which is which is takes place in the, the origins of the printing press. And, to be and fair, it's not just us. This has been on the hotness for like a couple I weeks know. now. That's like, true. It's not just it's us. Not, it's you too. Y'all made it happen, but it got me interested because it's about like the pioneers of printing. And in this game, is that how you print? I feel like you are you trying to uh, probably originally oh, screen but, print. That's how you make shirts. Yeah. But yeah. then you can upgrade the ways you print. So in this game, you literally are getting the ability to print uh, newspapers or whatever, and you can upgrade those things. You can get different color inks. You're like upgrading and sort of developing the Sounds technology amazing. of printing within the game. It's got some cool bits it where does. it has like old school newspapers and things you would put in the, the letters, yeah. basically stamps yeah. that would run through and go shoo, 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 and like print out stuff. And so it has the components. It looks to be very within, uh, like, the. I don't, I'm just intrigued. Yeah, I'm by very this. intrigued. I think it's so cool. It gets based on like whatever, and then like, and they're like, oh, they have little letters. That's neat. But it does seem interesting. And there's these gears which you can upgrade. You can pop on the player board, and then they, which they do is, this. Seem, they very do, like gears do. Yeah, yeah. Good I'm work seems cool. I'm We're very excited about it. And it, it seems like other people are too, because again, it's been it's been up in the yeah. hotness for a second it's now. Not just so, us. Yeah, it's at least a couple of us. But Gutenberg is number two. Let's go ahead and get number one. Back to space. Number one is Void Fall. Everyone is talking. Who's <laughs> for him? <laughs> and us. We're not huge again. We're not really into space these space printers. Is what I want. Yeah, printing in space, space farming. But nonetheless, Void Fall. I mean, this is a game that like. In our, in our chat when we live stream, everyone's like, everyone's like, you guys seen Void Fall? Yeah, I seen Void Fall. Yeah. People, it does I mean, it's look at, awesome. at the top of the hotness. Everyone is talking yeah. about it all over the internet, not even just on BGG. Everyone is aside from Void Fall. And it does seem cool. I mean, it's yeah. for a big 4X space game, it seems rad, but man, yeah. everyone is talking about Void Fall. Yeah, yeah, 4X space, you got little ships and things around those little stands or flying around and whatnot. It's got all of those pieces that you like. It does look like a really good production. Yes. Uh, this will be something that's coming soon. Um, yeah, this is like Void Fall is a game that's tailor made to be on the hotness of yes, board game. It really that's is. Not a, that's not a slam. That's no, not, not a at all. That's not praise. It's just what it is. Yeah. Um, and I know I have friends who are going to get Void Fall. They've talked about it. They've told me. So I'm like, cool. I won't be buying it, but I will play it. I with will you. play their copy. That's perfect. Thanks for doing it. Because it has the thing that's about it. It's like, you're like 4X space. I'm like, whatever. Couldn't care less. They're like, but tight resource management of a Euro game. I'm like, Ooh. well, no. This thing. You say resource management, pushing some cubes. Uh, so how about we like it? We probably would like Especially it. Especially if I don't have to pay for it. That works out That's great. That's the best part. Thanks, friends. That's number one on uh, the hotness void fall. So at the very end of the hotness, we always talk about the top 10 most logged games on BGG. So the top 10 most played games, at least the ones that were logged on BGG. Let's jump right into it. Number 10, we have Patchwork, which has 3,913 plays. That's a lot of quilts got made. That's a lot. You could a quilt for every child. Yeah. Not really. 3,000 is not that many. For the quilts. small count. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have Fantasy Realms at number nine at 4,020. That was kind of surprised me. It was for the spiel. Maybe it hit like BGA or something like that. I feel like Maybe a lot of times did. when things like this, is because they hit like Yucatar or BGA or yeah. something. Uh, we have Azul, which usually makes sense at 4,247. Maybe people are playing the old Azul, getting excited for the announcement of the new Azul. Maybe. I don't know. Seven Wonders Duel has 4,297. Lost Rooms of Arnon. You know this, 4879, played on BGA. It's great, works really well over there. Magic the Gathering's got 5,730. That's it, no one else played that. Terraforming Mars, 6,062. That will never be not impressive. No. That is a lot of Terraforming Mars. Because that's not a short game. The other no. ones, uh, I'll be, we have Wingspan, which is uh, 6848. That was pretty much always in this realm. Right, we have Marvel Champions, of course, at 8,752. And then of course, number one, as always, is the crew at 10,967. Seven, although that is less than normal because you yeah. know what 11 is? 11 is the crew. Mission Deep Sea. Which has 3,599. Which I really want to play. I'm excited to see when they flip and do they stay at one and two Probably. or does the original crew just drop off? No, I think, they'll, the I think they'll both be in the list forever. Just know that the other crew is coming next month. Next month. Nonetheless, that is the yeah. top 10 most played games in terms of log games. So make sure to log your games with BG because then maybe, you know, Bruges might be on the list. Oh, that'd be great. Probably not. Probably but not. But you know, um, so let's pop back up here and let's go into some Murph picks. My Murph pick for this month is going to be a kind of culling flow chart by the user Rubens. Now, I love these kinds of things. I'm kind of endlessly fascinated by BGG users and the, the things that they make to cull their collection or decide what kind of games they want to buy. I feel like all board gamers, not all board gamers, but a lot of us are kind of like analytical thinking and like numbers people. And so I just love seeing 
the creativity of how people go about managing their collections. It's kind of become a theme with my Murph picks. And Rubens here has made kind of like a flow chart to determine what games they're gonna keep in their collection. Because I think that's always the, the problem, right? You run out of room, what do you do? Some people are like one in, one out. Mike and I, we kind of generally do like one big call a year. We kind of collect, 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 collect and then we'll get rid of like 50 games. Just be brutal about it. But this is a big flow chart where it's like, how would I feel about the game if I was buying it right now? Which I think is a really interesting way to look at a game. Like if I was buying it right now, would I buy it? And that kind of determines whether or not they're gonna keep it. I think it's a really cool thing. So check out this post and check out this kind of flow chart and see if it might work for you. Cause I think it's, I don't know, I just think stuff like this really neat. So for my Murph pick, I have chosen uh, a creator spotlight. If you go scrolling down the front page of BGG, it will bring you no small amount of different things to look at, images, game pages, lists, and then creator spotlights that talk about different folks in our hobby that uh, make stuff. So I'm talking about Cabre, which is Ilya and Taylor, who are a couple that make awesome videos and they do photography work and things like that. I just love going through the creator spotlight to find cool new people to maybe watch their videos, see if they do live streaming or whatever it might be. So Cabre is my Murph pick. I highly recommend you check them out. If you get a chance, they have great content that's just really uh, wholesome and uh, informative and just makes me happy. So that's my Murph pick. So we like to wrap out every uh, episode of Best of Board Game Geek talking about Something our personal that favorite. We personally played this month, whether it's a new game or an old game. What was the hottest and most fun game for us? For me, it was Furnace. This is a game that did uh, hit that it's hotness. Hot. It's hot. It's got quick engine building mixed with auctioning that, that is auction. so interesting. The auctioning where it's like, I don't necessarily want to win. I want to barely yes. lose this card so I get all the, that steal or whatever from compensation. It's so good. And then you have a quick little engine building. You're just, you're trading in resources for other resources, resources for money, which are your points. Yeah. It does a lot in a very short period of time. So yeah. Furnace is just like great. Yeah, it's like the quick engine builder for me. It really yeah, is. We've been looking point. for that kind of game for a while. My favorite game of this month that we got to play was actually Paint the Roses, which we hit in Kickstarter sometime in this October month. October 12th. I believe so, yeah. Before we got that. a chance to play this game and this is kind of a co-op deduction game, not a social deduction game, but a, a straight up logic deduction game. Kind of like a co-op cryptid in a way, although they don't really play similarly, but it's kind of in that same general realm. Where you're putting things down, will give you clues. And yeah. But you can't you have, be explicit about what information yeah, you Yeah, you're have. building out the garden for the Red Queen, uh, the Queen of Hearts, and she's walking around trying to chop people's heads off. And you essentially have a card that tells you um, my pattern is having two yellow roses next to each other. So you're putting out these tiles and then you're putting out clues like, hey, this is a match for me. And yeah. other people need to look at like, okay, so Nick said this is a match for him. What could possibly be the match? And it's just really, really, really fun. I'm really excited to try like the modules in it. It's really yeah. pretty. I really like Paint the Roses. Yeah, super excited for that one to hit people's hands uh, after the Kickstarter runs and everything. Yeah. Super uh, cool. We do really uh, enjoy that game. So those are some picks for us, but we want to know for you, what did you play this month that really stood out? Whether that's a new game, an old game, something you saw demoed if you went to Gen Con or yeah. any places like Let that or know. Origins. Let us know in the comments below. And until next time, I'm Mike. I'm Nick. We are the Brothers Murph, and that was the best of Board Game Geek. See you later.